All right, that sounds great to me. Let me try to share my screen here. All right, so uh, I, this uh, is very similar to the presentation I gave last week. So if uh, you tuned in for that, this will be a bit of a review for you. But uh, uh, you know, today uh, John asked me to talk about a little bit about the settlement of the area that uh, became known as Saxagatha and then as Lexington uh, District in Lexington County. Uh, and so, like he said, my name is J.R. Fennell. I'm director of the Lexington County Museum. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have to put in a plug, we are open for tours. Uh, so even though uh, we are practicing social distancing and mask wearing, um, but if you'd like to come out and take a tour, we invite you to please come out. Uh, we actually are going to have some um, outdoor Christmas decorations, period decorations, uh, starting on Saturday. So if you want to come out and see some uh, uh, 19th century Christmas decorations and get in the Christmas spirit, come on out. Uh, but anyway, we'll go ahead and get started with this. Uh, and so again, some of this is review if you've seen some of my earlier uh, presentations, but um, really the first kind of uh, attempt at any type of settlement, I mean, again, there were, there were traders here that uh, may have come earlier, uh, but really the first kind of uh, attempted settlement really started in 1718 with the establishment of Fort Congaree, the first Fort Congaree. Uh, and uh, really, this came uh, about because of the Yamasee War, and, and I talked a little bit about this last week, but the Yamasee War, I feel, is just one of those events that's so overlooked, yet so important to the history of the area and to the history of South Carolina overall. Uh, and so not to go too deep in the woods, or the weeds, I mean, but uh, uh, the Yamasee, again, they were a Native American tribe that uh, it settled down in uh, Jasper, Hampton, Collison counties. Uh, and um, really because of uh, abuse, uh, miscommunication, misunderstandings, uh, and uh, uh, you know, different things like cattle kind of destroying the uh, uh, crops and, and villages of the Yamasee, uh, encroachment. Um, there was the threat of a, a census of the Native Americans and the building of a fort down there that really upset the Yamasee and uh, bred mistrust. Uh, and so the Yamasee decided to, to uh, attack the colony of South Carolina, uh, the European settlers in 1715. Uh, and the Native Americans that were here, uh, probably here in Lexington County, the Congaree, uh, decided to join in with the Yamasee on the side of the Yamasee. They joined with the Catawba and I think the Watery and a few other uh, tribes and uh, went down, got defeated, uh, and um, eventually because of that defeat and um, I think because of the loss of population because of disease, they decided to leave the area. Uh, but um, the war really scarred the psyche of South Carolinians and really made them start to fear kind of the, the borders more so than they did before. Uh, and so one of the things they wanted to do was to establish backcountry forts uh, really, this was to accomplish several things. One was to provide defense, as you can imagine, uh, but also really to try to control the trade uh, with uh, the Cherokee and some of the other Native American groups out there. Uh, it didn't last very long. Uh, they probably had about 21 men and, um, you know, really they, uh, they were out there by themselves, but it closed in 1722. Uh, but one of the things that, uh, that you continue to see, I think, is, again, they started to worry about their borders. Uh, again, not only did you have the Cherokee and Creek, which I think they, because of the Amacy War, started to mistrust a little bit, uh, but you also had the Spanish. Uh, and so one um, kind of idea they had was to create townships out of the backcountry. And again, uh, because the Congaree had left this area, uh, you know, it was pretty much uh, abandoned. I mean, there was really, um, you know, again, you did have some Native Americans hunting in the area uh, and maybe still living here as well. But for the most part, it was pretty much abandoned. Uh, and so um, they decided to carve out these townships in the backcountry, uh, and it really helped them accomplish several things. 
Uh, one of the uh, uh, things that helped them accomplish was to provide a buffer between the Native American tribes, uh, the Spanish, the French, uh, and the Low Country plantations in Charleston, uh, which is, of course, where the colonial government was. Uh, it also helped them to uh, uh, try to uh, gain more white pr uh, Protestants. So again, during this time period, the 1720s, 1730s, rice and indigo started to become um, grown in the low country and you started to have these huge plantations uh, that were importing a large number of African slaves. Uh, and so the balance between free and slave uh, became quite unbalanced. Uh, and so they really started to worry. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think there, there were some slave rebellions elsewhere, uh, in Barbados maybe, that really started to, to make them fear uh, what may happen. Uh, and so they wanted to get more white Protestants in. Uh, and so these townships allowed them to do that. Uh, and uh, so they established these townships. And the one that was located here, the one we care the most about, was at first called the Congarees. It was uh, established in 1733 uh, and then became known as Saxagatha after the uh, Princess of Wales, the, uh, her name was Augusta. She was the mother of the future uh, King George III. Uh, and so she was Princess Augusta of Saxagatha. They named it after her. Uh, and Fredericksburg, if you can see on the map here, uh, kind of over where Camden is today, that was named after her husband, the Prince of Wales. Uh, he died uh, and so never became king, uh, but uh, she lived on. They also named Augusta, Georgia after her. Uh, but Saxagatha was uh, an important site, uh, again, because uh, it was one of these uh, townships, and it was also located at the intersection of uh, very important kind of trading. Uh, and so one of them was the Okanichi or the Catawba Trail, which I have pictured here, in a trading road that, uh, that went from Augusta across Lexington, uh, up into North Carolina, Virginia. Uh, part of it later became known as the Great Wagon Road later on. Uh, but it also, and I don't have a picture of this to show you, but it also was the location where this trail, the Okanichi Trail, ran into the Cherokee Trail. And so this was the trail uh, that went from where he was, the 12th in your history park was, or excuse me, is, to the lower towns of the Cherokee up in uh, near Clinton. Clemson, Kiowa, that area. Uh, so it was also the location where uh, what became known as the state, Old State Road, uh, which went from Charleston into the backcountry met as well later on. So again, uh, and uh, military, uh, mer militarily as well. Uh, but so people began coming to live in Saxagatha uh, and uh, the, to attract uh, immigrants, they actually started to publish pamphlets saying that this was kind of the land of milk and honey, much better than Europe. Uh, and they actually come to European countries to attract some of these immigrants. Uh, the first place they began to attract to, to establish a township down in Perrysburg in what's now Jasper County. Uh, and uh, so there were a lot of, uh, uh, there's a good book I read about Perrysburg that talked about how Switzerland was uh, somewhat overrun with refugees at that time. And so a lot of people were looking to get out. Uh, but uh, so the Swiss started coming and uh, in 17, you know, starting in 1735. Uh, and uh, these are some of the family names that are still around today. Uh, again, the uh, Friday family, the Giger family, the Sin family. And again, if you saw my presentation, you heard this joke here at the museum. And uh, so when I give tours from around here, they, they think I'm talking about S-I-N. So they're like, ooh, what goes on in there? But, uh, you know, I say, no, 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 it's a family name. It's S-E-N-N. -N. Uh, but anyway, so uh, when these immigrants... Uh, came over. A lot of them came from um, from Europe. A lot of them would leave from England, in fact, uh, to Charleston. 
And uh, it's, it's interesting, there's a letter that was written in 1738, and they keep referring to Charleston as Karlstadt uh, in German, which is, you know, of course, German for Charleston, uh, which I think is interesting. But they came to Charleston, and they were supposed to receive uh, a certain allotment of land. So they were supposed to receive a uh, kind of a lot in the town of Saxagatha. And I use town in quotation marks. Uh, when I say this, because the town really never developed. Uh, but you were supposed to receive a town uh, lot, and then you were supposed to receive acreage out a little farther in the countryside. Uh, and uh, uh, you were supposed to establish a farm there. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, like I said, the town never really uh, occurred. They never really built a town because people would just live out in the country where their farms were. Um, so the Swiss started to come and they started to really um, take the good land, I guess. So again, if, you, uh, uh, if you've lived here a while or just kind of been out, a lot of Lexington is sandy, not very good for growing crops. Uh, and so a lot of the good land along the rivers, along the creek started to be taken. Uh, and so people had to spread out farther and farther from um, kind of the center uh, along the Congaree. Uh, um, you were also supposed to receive kind of tools to help you in your uh, in farming uh, and they would pay for this out of something called the township fund that was established uh, to kind of help bring people over and pay for them. Um, you did have people that paid their own way that managed to pay their own way and come here but you also had indentured servants that came over as well. Uh, and so indentured servants uh, were supposed to work off their debt uh, and um, people could buy uh, indentured servants, I think for, uh, let me see, I can't remember, for a couple pounds, I think, I forgot the exact, uh, exact number, but, uh, and then you will work off your debt for three to five years, something like that. Uh, but again, um, you also had um, you know indentured servants that couldn't find masters uh, and apparently you had complaints in Charleston about some of these immigrants begging in the streets because again they didn't have uh, anybody who would kind of immigration from Switzerland continued throughout the 1730s and 40s uh, but really was interrupted in the late 1740s by the war of Jenkins ear which uh, you know again is one of the I think best names for a war ever uh, but it was a war between England and Spain and uh, really kind of cut off uh, any kind of South. Uh, Switzerland also started to become worried about uh, immigration and you started to see them limit the number of people they could leave and eventually cut it off entirely. Uh, and so that's when you saw a lot of uh, what we would consider to be Germans come over. Uh, and so starting in the 1750s. And a lot of these Germans came from the southwest uh, part of Germany uh, along the Rhine River in the Baden-Württemberg state. That's where a lot of the, you know, kind of good Lexington County names that you hear today, uh, the Sheelys, the Harmons, the Kaufmans, uh, you know, a lot of those families came from that area. Uh, and so it's very interesting to me. Uh, there's a, a quote I found in, in Robert Merriweather's Expansion of South Carolina. Uh, and uh, Joseph Krell, who was an earlier probably Swiss immigrant, uh, he had come over in the 1730s. Um, he wrote a letter that uh, in the 1750s, the immigrants that were coming over, these German immigrants from Baden-Württemberg State and around that area, uh, he said that they were, quote, poor and of the meaner sort. So he uh, apparently was not a fan of those coming over at that point. Uh, but so you started again to see settlement uh, kind of spread out. Uh, and uh, basically by 1747, uh, you know, the good land along the river had kind of uh, been taken. They'd spread to 12 Mile Creek and it were actually starting to settle uh, on the north side of the Saluda River uh, in what's called, uh, what became known as the Dutch Fork. Uh, and uh, again, you know, this is, uh, I think, pretty well known by now, but uh, there never really were any Dutch people in the Dutch Fort. 
Uh, the term Dutch uh, is a corruption of the German word Deutsch, which is the German word for Germans. Uh, so again, and the fork either referred to the people of Volk or referred to the fork in the river right there between the broad and the Saluda. All right. Um, so uh, the, the people that settled, again, they were, uh, you know, mostly small uh, far, uh, owned small farms. They uh, were mostly, you know, they were, again, they were not rich. You didn't have the large plantations develop uh, that you saw in the low country or even over in Richland County later on. And I know John's probably maybe talk a little bit about that. Uh, but you did have some people that, uh, again, that owned uh, some good farming land that were able to uh, really kind of profit uh, you know, you had uh, uh, George Haig, who is very important in the history of the area, was a Native American trader. Uh, um, you know, he owned a, a kind of a, a large inventory when he died, uh, including 18 slaves. Uh, you also had William Struther, another uh, kind of man who was able to uh, really profit. Uh, and again, he died in 1751 and also owned uh, 18 slaves. Uh, but for the most part, again, you did not have the large population of enslaved workers that you did uh, elsewhere in the state. Uh, by 1790, only 10% of the population was enslaved at that point. Um, so really, it, it kind of uh, um, stayed small, you know, middle class and poorer farms for the most part. All right. So I've got uh, a plat here. Uh, and this is a typical kind of plat for land uh, that was received. Uh, this is a plat of land that was owned by Jacob Weber. Uh, Jacob Weber, it's a whole other story that I won't get into, but he's a very interesting character. Um, and so the immigrants that came over, and I, um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but they, they brought over a lot of their traditions. Uh, and, um, you know, one of those was their, their religion. Uh, the Swiss that came, uh, they were of the Reformed faith, which is a Calvinistic religion, uh, and uh, uh, they were ministered to by Reverend Christian Theus, who was a Swiss immigrant who came over probably 1739. Uh, his brother was a very famous portraitist in Charleston, Jeremiah Theus. The Gibbs Museum has uh, a lot of his portraits that, that survive. Uh, and uh, the Germans that came over later were of the Lutheran faith. And it seems for the most part from reading uh, you know, the, the accounts and, and uh, the council journals and that sort of thing that the, the Swiss really, uh, the reform members really were able to build some churches uh, and uh, kind of had more advantages in terms of getting ministers to help them out than the Lutherans were. They were kind of left out in the cold. Um, so, like I said, expansion happened and you did have some people that would uh, kind of, those, but uh, I do know, you know, there were several people that moved across the river uh, and you also had um, the opposite happen, people moving from east to west. And one of the advantages of the western side of the Congaree is that it's generally higher, uh, the ground is higher, so you didn't have as many problems with flooding. Now, that's not always the case, but uh, uh, you did have, um, you know, again, much higher land for the most part. Uh, so, um, you know, I don't want to spend too much time and take up all John's uh, time, but uh, just to kind of go ahead uh, and talk a little bit about um, what happened after. One of the, uh, so after the 1750s, uh, the big thing that happened was the Cherokee War. And again, this is the uh, southern part of the French and Indian War. Uh, and the Cherokee War really, uh, you know, you see some of the same things happen with the Cherokee that happened with the Yamasee. You had uh, miscommunication, uh, mistrust, misunderstandings, some abuses, uh, and, uh, you know, really uh, um, the Cherokee decided to, to rise up because of, uh, you know, again, a fear. They had been attacked on their way back from uh, Virginia by North Carolinians. The North Carolinians ruined it for us, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but they decided to attack. Uh, and so this area, while not, um, uh, you know, the battles never really happened here, but you did have Cherokees that would come down and raid farms, kill cattle, sometimes kill people. 
Uh, and um, you also had just the fear of that happening. So again, you would have people that would run to forts because there were rumors of Cherokee warriors in the woods. Uh, you would also have um, people that would run down to Perrysburg, actually, uh, down in Jasper County to kind of get away from it. Uh, and I think I saw Dan Tortora uh, on here. He wrote an excellent book just to give him a plug uh, about the Cherokee War. Uh, so he, he's the expert here. Uh, but anyway, uh, kind of sum things up, uh, um, you know, life uh, in this area uh, during that time period. Again, the Cherokee War really caused fear in the area. And you also had um, uh, really a lack of uh, involvement by the colonial government. The backcountry had really no representation. Uh, and there was really no law enforcement to speak of. You did have justices of the peace, but they were really limited in what they could do and um, what cases they could hear. And you did not have court, you know, every day. It was uh, it was not a, a weekly kind of thing. Um, so uh, you also had people, homeless people, that were driven off their land by the Cherokee War. Uh, and uh, um, really that caused people, some people to turn to violence. Uh, and you also had just kind of bandits, bad people uh, that were roaming around. And sometimes these bandit groups really kind of uh, uh, included mixed races, which really started to, uh, you know, strike fear in the hearts of, of the people here. Um, so to combat that, you had the regulator movement spring up, uh, which was a kind of a vigilante group that wanted to kind of instill order uh, and also, you uh, get more basically law enforcement and get more representation in the colonial assembly. Uh, and so they started to punish people on their own. Uh, and you actually had another group called the moderators uh, spring up uh, to combat them. And so they almost had pitched battles here in uh, Saxagatha. Uh, but fortunately, the colonial government stepped in and, and really tried to address some of the complaints uh, and they established courts in the backcountry and uh, sheriffs as well. Um, but uh, um, just kind of taking things to uh, the 1760s, 1770s, uh, the town of Saxagatha never really existed, like I said, but you did have a village spring up basically where the old Saxagatha was located. Uh, and uh, it was in, uh, it was a town called Granby. Uh, and so Granby, it was named after the Earl of Granby. Uh, and uh, just south of uh, where present day Casey is, it was located right around Friday's Ferry. Uh, and um, so basically, Granby was just kind of a, a place in the woods in the 1760s, but really grew uh, and to become very important. Uh, Granby was bigger than Columbia for most of its existence. Uh, and, uh, and by 1802, Granby had nearly 200 houses. It was a very important site for trade. You had tobacco warehouses. Tobacco was a big cash crop they grew here. Uh, and, um, you know, again, that was kind of the connection with Charleston and uh, via that, the, the whole Atlantic world. Uh, so uh, Granby was very important during this time period, the 1760 to 1800, uh, 1810 time period. Uh, the growth of Columbia kind of uh, stole its thunder a little bit as people moved across. Um, but uh, like I said, uh, just to kind of wrap things up, um, so the uh, cash crops were really tobacco. Uh, you had people growing hemp, uh, flax. Uh, this is before the cotton gin, so cotton was not really grown because it was too labor intensive. Uh, and uh, uh, flax was really what they grew uh, to make linen, which they made into uh, clothing. Uh, but uh, corn was very important to them. It was something that the colonial government really wanted them to produce to uh, create um, kind of self-sufficiency so they wouldn't have to rely on Pennsylvania, Virginia, and some of the other uh, colonies up north. They really wanted to become self-sufficient here in South Carolina. Uh, so that is really what they grew. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, again, I don't want to take all of John's time, but I'll uh, stop there and, um, you know, I'll take any questions if anybody has any. So unmute your microphones if you have a question. I know that was kind of fast and furious there. <laughs> okay. Um, if there are no questions, uh, thank you, thank you, Jr. That was that was great, uh, and I, I noticed you gave a few more details 
uh, about um, the living conditions and the settlement than you did the other day. But uh, thanks so much. That was that was a great introduction. And we're going to turn it over to John Manchester at Congaree National Park. He's going to be talking about uh, similar kinds of activities, but a little uh, further um, down the Congaree River drainage. Okay, Jonathan. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jr. Uh, that good segue into kind of where um, I'll I'll take it. I'll take you guys with um with um my my presentation here. Um, so get this um, going here. Um, actually, gotta switch my screens here real quick because you're looking at the wrong screen. <laughs> um, so. Um, I'm going to make sure that everyone can uh, see the, um, the real slideshow. And I don't know why I was doing this. Hold on, real quick. Share a different screen. There we go. All right. All right. So hopefully you're all looking at one that just says, Settlement of the Lower Congaree Basin. Um, if not, holler at me. No, um, we, don't have, we don't have it yet. Can't, can't, can't see it, Jonathan. Um, JR, if you would stop. Can't see it, huh? I'm sharing, and then Jonathan can take over. Oh, oh I know what's going on. Hold on. I think I know what I did. Hold on. Yeah, I okay. think I'm. Uh... Okay. There we go. I had hit screen sharing. That's why. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Yeah, operator error, operator error. All right, so does everyone see one that just says it doesn't have a time or a show task bar or anything on it? Yes. I it see. just says we're, presentation. We're good. Okay, good, awesome. All right, so yeah, like, so J, like JR said, um, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the settlement of this area of South Carolina really started up around, you know, what is today um, Lexington County, um, West Columbia, Casey, and um, it was it was it was slow going in in many cases for where Congaree is today. So um, this is a map that was done in 1757 um, of basically the townships in South Carolina, um, and you can see that you know that those colored areas there there are the townships, and then you have these big wide expanses of there's there's settlement in there. People are moving into those areas, but it's not very concentrated settlement. They weren't established as parishes or townships. Um, so if we kind of zoom into where we are today, um, this is the area around Columbia and Congaree, uh, what's Congaree National Park today. Uh, the park is right there where that circle is. You can see that you know, and you know, they still weren't calling the river the Congaree River at that point. They they still were marking it on the maps as the Santee River. Um, it would be um, a little while longer before they began calling it something different. Um, if you ever heard mention of the Congarees, they were actually talking about the area up around Saxagatha Township. That was the Congarees. Um, but you know, by the mid uh, mid 18th century, you had, you know, two primary townships up in our area, both on the uh, south bank of the of the Congaree. You had Saxagatha and you had Amelia. Uh, Amelia is today in the area um, that's Calhoun County and uh, St. Matthews uh, would be the primary town in that township. But like JR had said, uh, the ground over there is higher. Uh, the floodplain is not as extensive. So you don't have the, the same threat of your either home or crops getting flooded out on a regular basis when the river went up because the river went up on a regular basis. Um, so uh, those townships saw a lot of settlement compared to the area uh, that is uh, lower Richland County and the, the lower Congaree Basin today where Congaree National Park is, is located. So um, this area was, um, it was, it's a great area if you are looking for uh, land to 
uh, plant crops in, uh, at least in terms of the soil. The soil is very, very rich. Um, and so a lot of people who had uh, purchased lands or had land grants on the, the South Bank and Amelia uh, and Stacks of Gotha, um, they would start looking at land on the other side of the river and they would just be getting that land for its agricultural use. It was rich soil. Um, the constant flooding would, would help to uh, just renew all the nutrients that would uh, get soaked out by, by certain crops. Um, certain crops eventually that came into play like tobacco uh, and eventually cotton when that came into play, uh, came into um, high, high planting uh, was very, very um, soil intensive. It would basically suck out all the nutrients out of the soil. Uh, and so that's one reason why so many people were uh, would buy large, large, large amounts of land or, uh, eventually because they'd eventually basically kill the soil. Uh, so once those fields had basically become useless, they just let those fields go fallow for a while or they might plant it with something else and they just moved on to something another, another field on their property. Um, but bottomlands, uh, tracks were highly prized for agriculture. Um, and you can see, you know, that area right there in green, that is the Congreve floodplain, uh, basically going from just south of what is today Columbia, all the way down to uh, its confluence with the Watery River. And in some areas, especially in the area of what is today Congreve National Park, it is about four miles wide. So it's an extensive area of, of rich bottomland soil. Um, so you can kind of start asking the question, why did it take so long for anyone to begin settling down in the lower Congaree Basin? Uh, what, was, what was the reason? And we already kind of talked about a little bit of it, uh, myself and JR, is you know, the land constantly flooded. You really couldn't live there, but you could at least buy land in there and maybe try and use it. So um, one of the reasons that settlement in, in the area around uh, what is today Congaree National Park was so slow to take off. There's a couple, there's two primary reasons. The first one is that the Cherokee Path, um, which was the primary, you know, route between the backcountry and um, the, uh, the coastal cities, uh, Charleston and, 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 and areas down there, it was on the other side of the river. Um, it, you didn't have bridges you really only had one ferry eventually, and that would be Friday's ferry, uh, which would have been uh, up in Granby. So you didn't really have easy access to get to you get anything you were growing down to the coast. You might have had you, you would have had easier access to the Catawba or the Okinichi path, but that's going to take a lot longer to get it anywhere to market. So because you didn't have those easy, uh, that easy trade access, um, it became an area that people didn't look at as much until something came up that allowed them to get any crops they grew there to market faster. And the other was the distance from protection. Um, early on, uh, you know, you had Fort Congaree uh, because of the still lingering fear uh, from the Yamasee War. Uh, they didn't want to be too far away from protection. Uh, there's always safety in numbers. Uh, and also, you know, the militia and ranger companies, which would eventually come in, they, they would be, you know, in those areas of higher population. And so, you know, if you needed help and you're out in what essentially then was the middle of nowhere, it would take longer if there was a threat to, um, to your, um, to your family, your property, your well-being. And that threat would eventually not just be from um, native tribes, but also, you know, the regulators um, and just bandit groups that were out there. Um, floodplains and um, very extensive wilderness areas also would have been, you know, a great hiding place for runaway slaves. Um, maroons were in existence. Uh, in the mid 18th century, we just don't hear about them as much because there aren't as many records from that time uh, that mention them, but they were around and they would have been trying to hide in places like um, the floodplains of, of Congaree. 
So, um, and there's there's the fort right there. There's Congre Old Fort in what is today Granby, um, and Columbia. So zooming forward a little bit, you know, we get you know later into the um, 18th century, South Carolina does become much more populated. Um, this is the 1773 Cook map. You can see this is kind of a, a, a zoomed out image, but there's a lot more going on here in the state. A lot more, a uh, lot more towns are cropping up. The back country uh, is extending further up into what's now the upstate, and uh, the Midlands is becoming much more populated. And if we zoom in a little bit on where Congaree is today, um, you can see that you know it's picked up quite a bit. This is not an unsettled, unpopulated area, but it still is fairly sparse in the number of people living there. You'll see there's a lot more homes and um, property marked down on the south side of the river than there is up here. So um, if you know about you know where Congre is, Cedar Creek, um, which you can see pretty much right there in the middle of, of this, of this uh, inset of the map, that runs through Congaree National Park. Tom's Creek also runs down uh, into Congaree National Park. And there's really nobody living down there. Uh, but you look across the river and you can see, you know, there's the Lloyd, Thompson, Joyner's properties. Uh, there's the Humbleton property, which is over um, near the road that went down to Howells Ferry, which I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but uh, most of the settlement that was taking place um, in Rich, what's now Richland County was actually taking place up in, um, I'm gonna zoom in real quick, that area right there. I'm gonna go back for a minute, but that's where uh, much of the settlement was taking place prior to 1750. So I'm just gonna go back real, real quick here. So most of the settlement was taking place along, uh, what on this map is Jackson's Creek, we now call it Gill's Creek, uh, Green Hill, which isn't marked on this map, but it's basically, you know, right in between Jackson's Creek and Rayford's Creek, which we now call Mill Creek. Um, so there were um, a lot of land tracks being um, purchased and set up in that area, uh, but the area between Rayford's Creek and the confluence of the Watery and Congaree, still for the most part by the mid 18th century was largely uninhabited. And, and a lot of that is stemming from the fact that um, you still don't have a lot of access to the trade routes. Um, there was still the threat of Native American attacks in their, in, in their minds. Uh, the Cherokee War, uh, you know, part of, the, part of the French and Indian War down here in the South, you know, that's, you know, 1761 to 63, you know, there were still Native Americans hunting in that area. And there was still that fear. And so because you were still fairly isolated, people weren't really thinking about going in there. Um, but land was getting purchased. Uh, it was starting to get on people's radar. And the size and the extent of the floodplain, at least down in the lower Congaree Basin, is pretty immense. Like I said a little earlier, three to four miles in width. And it's hard to get through there. If you don't have a, a road, it is, you've been to Congaree National Park, it's a wilderness area. You don't have an established path, you have a hard time getting through there. Um, so uh, by 1757, you had uh, uh, about 50 land plaques that had been set up between Gills Creek and Rayford's Creek. And this is a map that was done of all the original land grants within what is today Congaree National Park. Um, this was done in 2001. It was still Congaree Swamp National Monument at that point. Uh, but you can see right here that there, a lot of the land eventually did get claimed by people. Um, people were starting to take advantage of the rich landscape down there, the rich bottomland soils. And so they began to try and pick up those land tracts. Um, if you look down on the bottom of the map where the river is, um, a lot of those land, uh, land plaques that were laid out down there, those are among the first. Um, the first one is actually that of John Lloyd, uh, which is 
um, up on the north side of the uh, of the floodplain, uh, over closer to the um, uh, right side of the map. And that was that was granted in 1749. That was the earliest one that we know of uh, land grant within what is today Congre National Park. And you can see, um, hopefully, you guys can see my mouse moving on this. Um, it's partially in the floodplain, partially outside the floodplain on the bluffs. So it's possible that Lloyd had some had some structures built over here. John Lloyd lived in uh, Amelia Township, uh, today's Calhoun County. Uh, so he probably wasn't living over here, but uh, he did um, have land over here and he probably had some, some buildings, possibly even slave quarters over there. Um, that he was uh, wanted to keep outside the floodplain, but part part of his land is within the Congreve floodplain. But most of the land tracks were were picked up along the river because you had access at least to some kind of a transportation route there. You could get a boat down the river, and so a lot of those land plats they're very long and narrow. That was by law. Uh, uh, any any land purchased in those areas uh, had to, it, it's it was about. It couldn't be more than I remember. If I remember correctly, one quarter of the the, the river frontage couldn't be one more, more than one quarter of the depth of the uh, of the actual plat. So you know, if you had you know, uh, if you had like a, you know, it was if you had a mile, if you went a mile in per se, that that's a long way. But if you went a mile in, you couldn't have more than a quarter a quarter mile of river frontage. Um, so a lot of those. Uh, tracts of land were picked up, you know, between 1749 and 1765. Uh, there are 75 original tracts of land that we can find that were granted out. Of those 75 within this landscape, 50 were between 1749 and 1765. So the vast majority, uh, two thirds of the land grants that were within what is today Congaree National Park, a core section of the park, I should say, were in that uh, essentially uh, 16 year period. And then the latest one we have in here was, um, I believe, 1806. Um, and that was by, um, a, um, I believe, an Adams. Um, so there, the, the land does start getting picked up. Um, and we know that you know, people were beginning to start looking at it as a, a landscape they could utilize. Uh, it did have an abundance of wildlife and fishing resources. So hunting would have been good in there. Fishing also would have been good in there. Um, it was also really good land for livestock raising. A um, lot of excellent forage for especially cattle and hogs. Uh, a lot of good ground mass. Um, there were there's cane there's cane breaks in there, which was a, a grass that cattle could use. Um, hogs they'll eat pretty much anything, but you have a lot of good ground mass like uh, acorns and other kinds of nuts. Uh, you have ample tree resources, uh, timber resources, so people would be using uh, the timber for building projects and, and other necessities. Uh, and there was the hope that if the land was cleared and developed, the soil would be really good for agricultural use. Um, like JR mentioned, major crops, you know, in the, in the mid 18th century are things like corn, uh, flax, um, uh, you have starting uh, the growth of indigo and the hope that you could use that landscape for rice. Uh, rice was the major cash crop down uh, on the coast. And there was the hope that because of the constant flooding that they might be able to utilize that land for, for rice growth. And by the late 18th century, uh, you had cotton beginning to start being grown in uh, the floodplain of the Congaree, more up towards what is today Columbia, the Hampton. Uh, Wade Hampton was the first person to start growing cotton in large uh, amounts here in um, the Midlands, and that was short staple cotton, not the Sea Island cotton that um, you might have found down um, closer to Charleston and the and the and the coast. So, like I said, uh, two thirds of the land had been granted um, to somebody by uh, 1765. Um, and most of those, like I said, along the river, people were not using those as, as home places. Um, they were using them most likely for agriculture. 
and some of those land grants didn't stay in their hands for very long. Uh, some, some landowners quickly realized this is too much. I really can't handle this. Um, and they sold it off pretty quick. Uh, others tried to hold on to it, tried to use it, and might have stayed for a little while. Uh, but it, it was, to use a modern term, it was a crapshoot. You know, you just did not know what you were going to get. You were gambling if you were trying to uh, plant large amounts of crops in the floodplain without actually developing the land. Uh, and that land development really wouldn't come until, you know, later in the uh, 19th century when uh, plantation agriculture and um, slavery uh, really began to pick up within what is today Richland County. But we do have one example of someone who did purchase land um, within what is today Congaree National Park. They had land both in the, in the floodplain and um, for use as agriculture and livestock and possibly even to, to live in the area. Um, so um, this is a, um, a land plat for uh, a man named Joseph Martin. Uh, this is, and I'll show you a map uh, that shows kind of where it is today in the park, but it's a pretty significant section of land. Um, a lot of it is within the floodplain, but he did have uh, land outside uh, of the floodplain on the bluff line. You can see up kind of towards the uh, top center where there's a, a creek running through. That's Cedar Creek. And this is over in the area around what is today South Cedar Creek Canoe Landing. Um, and you can see kind of down the bluff edge, uh, my mouse is kind of going around it. It says Martin's Old House. So it seems that, you know, he was, he did have a, 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 a structure there. Um, it doesn't say quarters or anything of that nature. So it does seem that he may have been living in the area. And there's a, a bridge and a road. Uh, the bridge isn't really marked here, but you know, there's a bridge right here, just uh, underneath the, where the house is marked and a road that goes down into the floodplain, down to an old field which uh, it's on a thing, it's on an area called um, uh, Cypress Lake. And that is today um, Big Snake Slough. And then there's Cowpen Gut just below that. Um, so it makes it, it makes it seem that, you know, he was using this as a cow pen. This old field down here um, was about 70 acres. So fairly extensive, a good area for possibly raising cattle or um, other livestock. Um, there, there is uh, a good amount of um, other information you can find on here, such as you know what kind of trees are growing down there, um, because trees were used as as um, survey po survey points. And this was this was one of those those tracts of land that got you know picked up uh, by someone. Uh, hoping to utilize this landscape. This is where it is today um, within the park. It would be off of what is say the King's, uh, what is say the King Snake Trail. And um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good sized section of land that Martin had. And eventually he will uh, sell this land to um, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney and Edward Rutledge. Names you may be more familiar with because they are very um, very well-known instrumental South Carolinians. Um, Edward Rutledge being a signer of the Declaration of Independence, Charles Coates with Pinckney uh, being a signer of the Constitution, uh, and also having uh, run for president uh, during, the, during the Federalist era. So um, th that's just the, kind of a, a little bit of, you know, what the land was like and what people were trying to use it for. Um, but you really needed transportation to get anywhere. And so lands acquisitions and settlement of the Lower Congaree Basin really doesn't start picking up until you have the establishment of, of ferry crossings and actual access to trade routes. And so uh, kind of going back to that uh, Cook map, um, there are three ferry routes by the time this map is done right before um, the American Revolution really kicks off. Um, so you have Friday's Ferry, uh, which was up in the area of Granby. 
um, it had it had been in operation for a while. Um, you know, uh, since um, since at least the mid 18th century, uh, but before. Um, so Friday's Ferry was an established ferry. Um, Jared can correct me if I'm wrong. It was a public ferry, so it did um, it did have license to charge fees to charge uh, a, a toll to get across. And then down here, um, oh, I went backwards. Uh, you have Howells Ferry, uh, which is just north of what is today the park. Uh, that was a private ferry. Uh, it was um, operated by the Howell family. They did not have permission to charge a, a toll to cross, uh, but you know people could ask permission to go across if they wanted to. And then you have McCord's Ferry. Uh, it has gone by a couple names, uh, Jackson's Ferry, uh, Joiner's Ferry, but it's most well known as McCord's Ferry. Uh, the area of land you see right below it, uh, where the river kind of juts up, that's Buckhead Neck. Uh, today that is um, not within, uh, what is today, Calhoun County. Uh, it was cut off in, seven, in, 19, in 1852 when the river flooded and uh, made a new cutoff. So that's now what we call Bates Old River today. Uh, but the McCords uh, had been living in that area since uh, the 1750s. Uh, they uh, ran a private ferry and eventually in 1758, uh, they were able to get, um, no, 1766, uh, they were able to get permission to operate a public ferry. So they were able to actually uh, charge a, a toll to get across and there's a road that runs north, and that would have taken you up towards uh, Camden. And so that became a major trade route, uh, the McCord's Ferry Road. Uh, it connected the areas north, uh, you know, Camden, the Waxhaws. It connected uh, those areas down to the Old State Road, the Cherokee Path, the road that went down towards Charleston. So this became a major, major, major uh, trade corridor uh, by uh, the 1770s, right before uh, the Revolutionary War uh, kicks into high gear. And it was a strategic point as well during that conflict. Um, it was skirmished over uh, several times. Where you see the Lloyd House, uh, that's near where the Mott House would have been. That would have been Fort Mott. Uh, during the um, during the occupation of South Carolina by the British, and that area would have been where the Battle of Fort Mott was, and Francis Marion and General Greene will eventually meet at McCord's Ferry Tavern uh, after that battle uh, was fought in 1781. So uh, by the late 1700s, people are beginning to pick up uh, a lot of land within uh, the floodplain land begins to consolidate into the hands of uh, one person. And so by the 1850s, zooming forward, um, you had basically 11 land holders within what is say the core of the park. So you went from 75 land grantees having land in uh, 1802 or having gotten first grants to 11 by just before the American Civil War. So, uh, and those, those plantation owners were hoping to uh, capitalize on cotton, but also growing things like corn and other things that they could use as subsistence crops, uh, predominantly for um, the large slave populations they had on, on, their, um, on their plantations. Uh, so um, that's kind of where I've, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'll wrap it up there. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, but I did see there were some, um, questions that have popped up. Um, so um, some of those might also be for, and that might be JR talking a bit too as well. Um, so any questions for Jonathan or JR? I do see one from, uh, from, from Dennis uh, asking if parts of the floodplain of Congaree were cleared for farming and are those areas now considered to be second growth? Um, and how was the floodplain actually cleared? Um, so yes, parts of the floodplain were cleared. Um, some of those areas, uh, it depends on what trees you're, you're talking about. 
Um, some of the trees that are in those areas now, because of when they were cleared, um, they're getting to what we would call old growth trees because they are of species that don't get to the same age as like a bald cypress, which can, which takes a while to get to old growth age. Um, but it's not necessarily what we would call virgin forest. It, it has been, it has been used. And a lot of those same areas that got used for farming and were cleared during that time also eventually got cleared again in the you know, late 19th and early to mid 20th centuries when they were logging. So uh, they would now be considered even age second growth um, if they were logged more recently as well. And how was it cleared? Well, um, to, to be blunt about it, the, the landowners didn't really have to, they weren't worried about the labor themselves because they weren't doing it. Um, any land that was cleared for um, especially large agricultural use, it was done by slave labor. Um, and plantation owners in, in, in pretty much across the South, but you know, here in Richland County you know, specifically, if, if they didn't have enough um, enslaved labor on hand themselves, they would hire out. Um, they would they would hire out from other plantations to get uh, their enslaved persons to help them. So you could have as as many as you know several hundred um, slaves working on clearing uh, a section for possible agriculture use, building dikes, uh, cattle mounds, things like that for whatever use they were gonna they were gonna use. Um, and it was a pretty pretty gargantuan task. Um, and what makes it kind of a sad reality is that the men and maybe even some of the, some women who were working that they were getting no pay for it at all. They were doing it, you know, um, against their will. Uh, Jennifer just asked, uh, when you're talking about escaped slaves, did you use the word maroons? Uh, yes, I did use the word maroon. Um, so in order to not take a lot longer, because that is a that's that's a subject that we can go into great depth on. Um, a maroon is an escaped slave who, instead of running to freedom somewhere where you would, you know, there was there were was no slavery, um, which in the colonial era you didn't have that. You know, slavery existed all up and down the eastern seaboard. Uh, many of those uh, escaped slaves would run into just uh, very wild unpopulated areas like the Congaree floodplain uh, and they would either hide out there for a short time or they'd establish themselves in large groups. Uh, some would run and they would join, um, especially at this time, they may have run and joined some of the native tribes. Uh, in our area, not as likely um, as it would have been down in areas like Florida. Um, the Seminole had a, a, a more of a tendency to actually um, adopt escaped slaves into their into their tribes, while uh, the Catawba, uh, for example, here seemed to not have had a really you know fond look outlook of of enslaved persons who were actually used quite often to to hunt down escaped slaves. Um, but the term maroon itself comes from uh, it actually comes from a Spanish word cimarron, which meant uh, wild or untamed. And it was a word used to describe escaped slaves from uh, both Caribbean and Central and South American plantations who ran into uh, interior areas of the islands or um, the areas uh, where Spanish, British, or even French uh, settlement had taken place and plantations were established. And they would just go in there and establish themselves in communities and were very uh, hard to uproot. They were very wild um, people as they were seen by the um, European colonists. And so they were hard to... Uh, either bring back into slavery or to defeat because they would uh, raid plantations and uh, to take goods and things like that. But that word got corrupted into English as maroon and uh, it was used to describe escaped slaves until 1939. Uh, most of them would have been, have been, been described as runaways, uh, vagabonds, layabouts, things like that. Um, and uh, got the question, uh, Native Americans manipulated their environments to make them more perfect for deer and other species. Was this normal? Um, and the answer to that would be, um, it's quite probable it happened in Congaree. Um, we can't necessarily say for 100% certain, 
uh, where it would have happened. Uh, but we do have cane breaks. We do have, you know, there, there were cane fields in there. Um, and so it's, it's likely that they were doing something in there. Um, whether they were doing it with fire or not, it'd be hard to say. Fire doesn't really catch too well in floodplains uh, because the soil, even in the summertime, tends to still be fairly moist, uh, still holding a lot of moisture in it. And so, you know, we've had uh, trees that have gotten hit by lightning in the floodplain in the middle of summer and the fire doesn't go anywhere. Um, it stays right with that tree. It doesn't spread. Uh, the only time that that's a possibility is if we were in drought. And if we had a drought, um, that would be pretty disastrous for, um, for the landscape. So um, it's possible they were, they were using fire within, within the floodplain to, to do that, but um, we just don't know. We don't have an exact answer on that one. But it was, it was a common practice. They did do it. You know, they, it's possible they did it outside the floodplain within what's State of Concrete National Park and some of those areas. Um, but within the floodplain itself, we just can't say. John, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned that, uh, uh, I think you said in the 1850s it was that the, a flood caused uh, the river to change course and created Bates Old River. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know of any other, I mean, kind of significant changes during the colonial or, or antebellum period uh, to the river in the park? So, um, I mean, it's 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 constantly changing, as I'm sure you're uh, you're you're aware. It's 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 a regularly changing uh, um, landscape. Uh, the the other big one that I would really think about would be um, in the 1820s when um, you had what was called Butler's Cutoff. Um, I don't have a really um, great map of it, you know, on on hand at the moment. Let me see if I can. Um, I'll have to share. I'll, I'll share a map with. Uh, with you, JR. But um, so in the 1820s, uh, the Adams family, you all can snap if you want to. Um, <laughs> it, um, it was, uh, they were a very large landowning uh, family in Lower Richland County. Uh, the um, first patriarch, uh, Joel Adams, was known as Joel of All because he owned, um, the Adams family eventually owned about 20 some thousand acres in Lower Richland County. And they had about 5,000 acres within what is today Concrete National Park over on the western side. Um, and if you look at a map today of, of, of Congaree in the area, you'll see something called uh, Cook's Lake right on the uh, southwestern boundary of, of the park. And so um, in the early 1800s, that was an active river channel. And uh, at some point, uh, it got cut off. Um, I'm still not 100% sure if it was a natural cutoff uh, that just, just happened or if it was a natural cutoff that was occurring that was then um, just helped along by, by um, human hands uh, because the Adams uh, had a, had a, it sounds like a, a landing down there. They had a shad fishery down there. Uh, they would, um, during the shad runs, use the large amounts of fish to feed, um, feed their large um, large number of slaves because it's cheap food, uh, easy to obtain. And when the river got cut off and the new channel was created, uh, Joel Adams was unhappy about that. He was very upset um, because that it was going to ruin his shad fishery. Um, and possibly it was also likely to, you know, stop his easy access uh, by boat down the coast because they did have a steamboat uh, the James Adams, uh, they were using uh, the transport things down river and also bring stuff back up. Uh, so that one was also a pretty significant uh, change to the river landscape. Um, another change we've had is erosion. Uh, we had, there was a Native American uh, woodland era mound um, that we had um, record of that um, has since unfortunately been um, completely um, lost due to just the erosion and the change in the riverbank. Uh, so changes are occurring all the time. If you look at a, a map, you'll see the, um, you'll see the um, oxbow lakes that are still very close to the, the river today. So it's changing on a regular basis, but that's another one of the big ones, uh, Cook's Lake, Butler's, Butler's Cutoff.
Any other questions? For me or JR, if anyone has anything else for JR. Well, no, Jennifer, I, I, I do not know. I do not, I, I, as far as I know, I do not have a connection to uh, the, um, to Manchester Forest. Um, I'm a middle, I'm a Midwesterner by, by birth. So I, I'm, I'm a transplant here to South Carolina, but I do love it. I do love the area and have really enjoyed learning the history about it. I wanted to ask a question. Um, do, is there much evidence of people moving you know, downstream or upstream from the Congaree's, um, Fort Congaree area to the, to the lower basin and vice versa, you know, through those middle years of the 18th century uh, into the late 18th century, do you know? Um, and JR might be able to answer, uh, speak to this too. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of the land grants, um, you can you can find connections to people who were living up, you know, up towards Columbia and Granby, uh, and also in what is today Calhoun County and Lexington County. Um, there are a number of people who are purchasing. They purchase large areas of land on both sides of the river, um, downstream between you know the the where the Broad and, and Slough to come together and where the Congaree and Watery come together. So um, there, there was there was overlap. Um, if you look at the land plats and the in the land grants, you definitely would find um, people who purchased. Um, you know, either um, most likely it would have been up towards the, what's now Columbia, and then coming downstream, rather than purchasing downstream and coming upstream. But it probably did go both ways. Um, but I would say more likely downstream and settlement kind of spread that way. But we have to go, I have to, I have to really dig into some of the, um, the land plats and everything to see on that end. Uh, if JR knows anything, um, yeah, if you know anything, JR, go I mean, it go seemed, it. Uh, you know, again, I'm not, uh, uh, um, on, on that, but, uh, you know, you did see, I think, uh, middle uh, 18th century, 1750s, was saying, I mean, really, if people moved, it was around the Rayford's Creek area. I mean, I really don't think you saw it. You really had to move downstream until, you know, like John was saying, you had those ferries established and that sort of stuff. Um, they mainly stayed, seemed that, and, and really in the, I think 18, especially the early to mid uh, 18th century seemed to have more people move from east to west than west to east or anything like that. So they seemed to really go up, you know, into the Saluda, at least those Germans and, and Swiss Germans, they, they went towards the Saluda more so than down towards the watery. Yeah, and Tom has a question, was logging a commercial venture to the coast? Logging has been a commercial venture within at least the Congaree um, floodplain um, since settlement began uh, within uh, within that area. Uh, started out small, obviously didn't have uh, ways to get, you know, a ton of lumber downstream at those day, uh, in those, in those, you know, early years of settlement. Um, commercial logging didn't really take off until the, you know, 19th century, but lumber, uh, lumber harvesting and shipping timber downstream did occur in the um, 18th and 19th centuries, um, but it really picked up late 19th, early 20th. Are there any more questions for JR or Jonathan? Well, I want to thank JR and Jonathan for this fantastic presentation. I think it gives us a lot better idea of what was happening in the 18th century in terms of settlement, um, sort of the connections between the upper basin and the lower basin, and uh, the place names and um, sites such as Fort Mott and so on that that played an important part in not only what's happening around present day Congaree National Park but, but what was happening around the Congarees. I want to invite everyone to 
tune in next Tuesday. We will be um, talking about focusing on focusing in on the Congarees as a place name and as a place of a lot of important uh, historical events, uh, especially in the 18th century. Uh, we'll be featuring David Brinkman, who has a lot of detail. He's, he's a renowned local historian. There's a lot of detail and a lot of interesting stories about what was happening around that area, um, intrigue and mysteries and controversies. So please tune in next Tuesday at 11, uh, I mean at 10, excuse me, between 10 and 11. Um, I'll be sending out an invitation for that. Uh, if anyone has any other comments, I wanted to say that both JR and Jonathan mentioned the Cherokee Path. Cherokee Path runs right through the 12,000 year history park. So we have that connection. And of course that eventually became the old state road uh, linking sort of the middle belt of the, uh, of the trade between the, between the Kiwi area and, and the lower part of the state toward Charleston. So, um, and I wanted to remind everyone that we hopefully will be uh, getting out back in the park with our in-person tours. Um, maybe by March or certainly sometime in the spring. So stay tuned to our website at kc12,000years.com and you'll get some updates there. Uh, again, guys, this is a very good presentation. Uh, we've got, we got some really good questions. Thank you everyone for participating. Are there any other comments or questions? If not, we'll bring it to a close. Um, Everyone take care, stay safe, and we'll see you next Tuesday at our next presentation. So long, bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Thanks.